So uh, we're here to talk about, we as a collective, uh, Jessica Ripley, Andrea Poncia, and Renee Wimet is not here from CMHA, uh, but we've been working together and really what we've been focusing on is looking at the evidence, uh, the literature, uh, and, and the community landscape around postvention. And to, to do that properly, we wanted to, to get everybody on the same page really about what is postvention, um, why are we talking about it, and in order to talk about it, we have to first talk about what's contagion and, and where it clusters. And so we're going to take you through that. Uh, I think it's best just as we're going through to shoot up your hand and ask questions and we can kind of have a dialogue as we go through if anybody has questions. So uh, thanks to Andrea for putting this together and to Jess and Renee who's not here for uh, putting this work together. So um, suicide contagion in Canada, uh, you know, people might think that contagion is quite rare and, and it is in one regard in that it doesn't happen often, thank goodness, but at the same time we do know that 24% of youth in Canada have reported that they've been exposed to a schoolmate's uh, suicide. And from Dr. Coleman, who we heard uh, about a little bit earlier, he's got recent research uh, that says that uh, youth who are exposed to a peer suicide have shown to experience suicidal ideation attempts uh, up to two years. And so we, we do know that, it, that, it, that it's real, and we also know that it's specifically most real for those who are already at risk. Uh, so those who have already experienced trauma or who have already had suicide ideation, um, this can really increase the, the likelihood of uh, them thinking more about suicide after uh, they know someone who's, who's died by suicide. Uh, suicide uh, clusters, um, typically it means that there's uh, three or more suicides. There's, there's two uh, deaths uh, in particular, but as we're talking about suicides. And there's two types, there's, there's a mass cluster and a point cluster. So um, I'll explain the difference in it because we've experienced both recently. Uh, the mass cluster is triggered by a high profile suicide, so we can think about Robin Williams as a recent example, where it's promoted a lot in the media and it's hard to escape the news about it. So Robin Williams is one, uh, before that there's more, but a big pop culture one would be uh, Kurt Cobain from Nirvana where it was, it was international. So an, an event that occurs, a uh, suicide that occurs where the media is just, is, is, is really hammering on it and it's not going away. A, a point cluster is one that happens geographically, and we see in a point of time and in a geographic area more deaths by suicide than would normally occur. Um, and so, as we'll see on the next slide, we have actually, unfortunately, experienced that here in Ontario. So we had in, in Woodstock, which uh, is here in Ontario, uh, five youth suicides in, in 2016 at the University of Guelph, four deaths by suicide in, in one semester. And then, of course, in Attawapiskat, and we could have listed, unfortunately, some other um, communities in the north that have absolutely experienced this. So, unfortunately, we do know this is real, and it, and it has, has occurred here in Ontario. So, so what what is postvention then? So, we, we worked through contagion, is real, and clusters are unfortunately uh, a real thing. So, what's postvention? So, I'll read the definition that's Andrea is very nicely broken down into the bullets here. And, and, and stop me at any time if you have any questions. So postvention involves a consistent response to suicide clusters that includes a collaborative cross-sectoral community response plan activated as quickly as possible after the death, including psychoeducational and psychological debriefings, screening of high-risk individuals, counseling for those at risk, responsible media reporting, and evaluation of the postvention response. Many of those we have in place, but many of them are happening in isolation and, and not as a collaborative. And that's really what we want to talk about and try to address. So there are also two types of uh, postvention response, uh, passive and inactive. So with the, um, with, with the passive, it, it's more things like leaving brochures and waiting rooms, putting up posters, uh, making people aware of where resources are, and the onus is really on the individual uh, to take action. Uh, some success in that, but uh, as you can imagine, the active one uh, has shown to be a best practice uh, for postvention. So in an active response, um, in an ideal situation, the emergency response services would deliver the immediate, the, um, the community would then, uh, about three days later, step into place uh, and be available after that, working with the emergency response to keep that coordinated. So it has been shown to be a best practice and we're looking more at the active versus the passive. So Ottawa's immediate response, um, we, we were hoping to have uh, 
Donna from Victim Crisis Unit at the Ottawa Police Service with us today. She's going to come, I think in September, we're going to have her. But we, we, we are very fortunate here in Ottawa, we have a tremendous group uh, called the Victims Crisis Unit at the Ottawa Police Service who provides the immediate uh, response. Um, it, it, they do a heck of a job about it and looking forward to having Donna here to talk more about it. Yeah. I'm sorry, just really quickly. So, yeah. I know with um, completed suicides, unfortunately, there's contagion. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know with, with just, not just, but suicide attempts? Yes, there is. <coughs> there is, absolutely. Any time that we, uh, and I mean, this is the thing about the show 13 Reasons Why, talking about uh, suicide in a safe way, uh, in a safe environment with, with trusted individuals, um, is, is what's encouraged. But when you can't control the message, and when other people are discussing it in a way that might not be safe and may glorify or glamorize it, um, that's where you, you get into concerns about uh, clusters or contagions. And so after an attempt, if all of the peers, for example, were to know about it, but the, the, the trusted you know, adults in the community, whether it's a school or in a, a community setting, don't know about it and aren't able to step in to, to have a safe and open dialogue about it, then, then for sure they can increase the risk factor. So even with an attempt, um, th there's, there's, there's risk for sure. So, so what we really wanted to say from the last time moving into this one is that uh, we're really fortunate here in Ottawa. We've got great supports immediately after the suicide. It's that next step that we really want to look at as a community, what can we do? So how do we work with um, what's already in place and moving into the next three days, the next four days, and, and from that active response, how do we keep that going in a coordinated way? So that's really what we're going to be focusing on, um, is moving from some of the informal gray areas into some of the more, maybe not formal, but into more, some of the more structured and, and coordinated approach. So. Um, we also know, of course, the sooner that we can activate it, um, the better it's going to be. So as soon as that we uh, are made aware of, of a death by suicide, the, the sooner that we can activate the response and uh, alert those in the community who would be able to provide a response, either formal or informal, the, the better we know it's going to be th through all of our channels, from emergency services to community health center to school, um, uh, right down to the, to the peer networks as well. So, and, and a big takeaway from us here from these bullets, a really big one, and we've experienced that here in Ottawa, is it is super hard to plan during a crisis. It is really hard to be proactive and coordinated and work together as the crisis is unfolding. And we've experienced that um, with, with crisis related to suicide and, and even the flooding from being uh, someone who was helping set up the emergency uh, shelters during the flooding. It was, it was really tough, and, and we took away from that that we've got some good plans, but you throw a lot of them out of the way when you're in it, and you need to make sure that everybody, and this is why we're doing this, is on the same page about what their role is and what they do and, and how do we talk to each other during that. So I think that's a big takeaway from the most recent crises that we've been through related to this and other issues is that let's be as proactive as possible. Let's all, all get on the same page so that, goodness forbid, we are in this situation, we, we're working together and we know what to do. Um, in the strengths, uh, this is kind of just a shout out to say, you know we're doing great stuff. You know, going around the table at the round table here, hearing about the work that's going on, we know we're doing great things. Um, but it again is that, you know, from the, the network, the coalition, the, you know, Western Ottawa, all the great things that are happening, YouthNet, the peer group, again, how do we bring that all together and how do we speak that same language? So it's not that we're lacking in community assets and strength, it's quite the opposite, that we're quite rich in them here. And it's, and it's how do we work together and bring those together. I feel like I've said that three times, but just a shout out, I guess. Uh, so existing services, kind of saying the same thing here. So I think we can skip over that, but great job, everyone. Um, so let's get into the next part. So what's, what's unknown, what's needed, is we have, uh, and, and led by Andrea on this one, really put together a survey that's grounded in, in evidence and best practice and, and based on what the literature is saying, because we really, really want to find out what are we all doing around this? And so a survey has been put together, and our next step is what we really want buy-in from everyone. Is, uh, let's complete the survey uh, that showcases what our organization is doing. Um, do we have plans in place? And that'll allow us to then take all that information from the survey and really lay out and, and really be able to see kind of a clear picture of what's going on. And from there, then we can identify gaps and assets and strengths 
and then we can talk about next steps, whether it's some other working groups that might form from it for, you know, whether it's communication or um, psychoeducation or assessment, whatever it might be, it's difficult to say right now what we need without having that clear picture of the landscape. So what the, what the ask really is, is that when Andrea um, sends out that survey and it comes out uh, to everybody, really take some time to, to, to complete that and, and, uh, and, and give your, your best answers as, as it relates to your organization and identify at the end when there's comments, you know, if there's anything else you want to share about this because we really want to have a community-wide buy-in and we want to be, you know, bring this back in a few months to say, um, here's, here's what the plan, you know, could look like, here's what the different groups will set up and here's how we can work together. So um, that's the big next step for us as, as, as our working group is to get that survey out to you and you know, as far as it goes with this, you know, I, I think we're in a really good place that no one needs convincing that it's a good idea. We were wondering if that was going to be the case, but I think we're in a really great place that we're all ready to come together and work together. So now it's about, let's get this done, let's put all the information back out to everyone, and then let's look at tackling this so we can be collaborative. Mm -hmm.